In this lesson, we're continuing our discussion of the inchoate offenses. Specifically, we're going to begin our discussion of conspiracy. And in this lesson, we're really just going to introduce the basic principles of conspiracy. The goal here is to understand the basic common law elements and some of the pertinent statutory modifications we should be aware of, but really just to get a big picture understanding of the concept of conspiracy. And then in our next lesson, we can really start to break down a lot of the special problems and issues that can arise in a conspiracy analysis on a criminal law fact pattern. But again, here the goal is just to kind of get a big picture understanding of what conspiracy is, because I know this can be a really complicated topic. So big picture, when we're thinking about conspiracy, Essentially, what is being criminalized here is people coming together, working together to commit crimes or to engage in criminal activity, right? We believe, or at least, you know, states that have conspiracy law are basically saying we think that there's inherent danger in people coming together to commit crimes. When people start working together with a criminal objective in mind, it has a lot of special inherent dangers that are not necessarily present when one person is operating by themselves to accomplish a criminal objective. You have things like scale, efficiency, collectivism, right? Think about Ocean's Eleven, right? Ocean's Eleven is kind of a cult classic movie. If you haven't seen it, no problem. The basic idea is, right, you have 11 co-conspirators who come together, right, and form a plot or an agreement to steal a lot of money from a casino, right? But the thing that makes it interesting, right, as a movie or entertaining, is each of these 11 co-conspirators kind of brings a unique skill set to the table. And probably none of our 11 co-conspirators could have accomplished this criminal objective of stealing money from the casino by themselves, right? If any one of them was operating by themselves, probably couldn't have pulled off this theft properly, right? But when they all come together and they each bring in their own skill sets and they divide up the labor, it's very efficient and they're ultimately able to successfully steal this money from the casino, right? This is kind of the inherent danger of having people work together to commit crime, right? There's greater scale, there's greater efficiency, people can bring unique skill sets to the table, people that might be good at one thing or good at another thing can bring their skill sets together to accomplish larger scale criminal activity, right? So this is one of the dangers, just the ideas of efficiency, divide, division of labor, and scale, much like you would see in just the operation of a business. As all of these things grow, as you have more employees at a business, the larger that business can usually grow, right? But on top of this, another kind of inherent danger that legislators see with people coming together to commit crimes is the idea of collectivism, right? Sometimes there's a belief that if people are working together to commit a crime, right? Say five people come together and agree to kill a victim, right? They're going to murder a victim. Well, if one of those five co-conspirators changes his mind and decides, hey, you know what? I don't want to kill this victim. It might be difficult once he's entered into the agreement with these other four co-conspirators to get out of the plan, right? I mean, not only could there be danger to himself, I mean, if you go to four people that you told, hey, I'm gonna help you murder this person, and then you say, I'm having second thoughts, right? There could be some problems for you from those other four conspirators. It's just harder to abandon the plan than if you were working by yourself, right? If that person was working by himself with the objective to kill this victim and changed his mind, right? The legislators that are enacting conspiracy law think that the policy is it would be easier for that individual, that person who has this plot to murder this victim to abandon the plan versus when he's working with four other co-conspirators, it becomes harder to withdraw or ab abandon the criminal activity, right? And then this is kind of just exponential as the more people come together. So, these are some of the many inherent dangers with criminal conspiracy, right? And the reason I'm kind of going through some of the policy concerns is because this kind of illustrates why the merger doctrine does not apply to conspiracy. Remember with attempt and solicitation, we said, 
With both of these crimes, you have attempt and solicitation, which are the inchoate offenses, and then you have a target offense, right? And if the target offense was completed, the attempt or the solicitation merges with the completed offense, and the defendant will not be punished for both attempt and the completed offense or solicitation and the completed offense because the merger doctrine applies. With conspiracy, it's completely different, right? Conspiracy, a defendant can be punished for the conspiracy as an inchoate offense at the same time the defendant is being punished for the completed target offense of the conspiracy. And the idea is conspiracy has a separate social harm, right? With attempt, for example, it's very hard to separate the social harm of an attempt from the completed social harm of the target offense, right? Think about attempt to commit murder, right? If somebody takes a gun, points it at a victim, pulls the trigger, and the bullet misses, right? That's attempt to commit murder. But if the bullet hits, it is murder, right? Either way, the social harm stays the same, right? We're trying to prevent people from killing other people. Whether it's attempted murder or completed murder, the social harm involved is killing another human being. That's what we're punishing. That's what we're trying to prevent with attempted murder or the completed offense of murder. Conspiracy is a little bit different, right? The social harm of a conspiracy is actually the agreement itself. People coming together, right? People working together toward a criminal objective has these special inherent dangers and social harms that are being punished, right? That are being criminalized. So that's why conspiracy doesn't merge with the completed offense because we can separate the punishment, right? For conspiracy to commit murder, you're being punished for agreeing with other people to kill somebody. That special danger involved with working with other people to commit the murder, right? We can separate that social harm from the murder itself, right? If you actually go and complete the offense of murder, right? That's actually about killing people, right? The social harm is one human killing another human, right? We're trying to prevent people from killing other humans when we're prosecuting people for murder. But when we're prosecuting people for conspiracy to commit murder, we're trying to prevent that social harm of people coming together to commit crimes, right? So hopefully this makes sense, but that's the policy rationale behind why the merger doctrine does not apply to conspiracy. In other words, a person can be punished for conspiracy to commit murder and the completed target offense of murder at the same time, right? Which makes conspiracy really unique as an inchoate offense when we're thinking about attempt, solicitation, and conspiracy. We know merger doctrine applies to attempt and solicitation. It does not apply to conspiracy because in jurisdictions that don't have merger doctrine for conspiracy, they're basically saying we think conspiracy is its own social harm that we can separate from the target offense. Just the mere fact of people agreeing to work together to commit crimes has its own social harm that's different from the target offense, right? Therefore, no merger doctrine. A person can be liable for conspiracy to commit murder and the completed target offense of murder at the same time. Okay, but this is enough introduction of conspiracy. Let's just jump into the common law elements and begin to flesh this out in a little bit more detail. So at common law, conspiracy consists of an agreement expressed or implied between two or more persons to commit a criminal act or to accomplish a legal act by unlawful means with the intent by at least two persons to form the agreement and to achieve the object of their agreement. So three elements, we'll see these are actually pretty straightforward, right? Number one, we need an agreement, right? It can be expressed or implied between two or more persons. An agreement is essentially a meeting of the minds, right? Think back to contract law. It's kind of like mutual assent. An agreement is a meeting of the minds. The important thing to recognize is this can be expressed or implied, right? It's really nice if it's expressed, right? If we see in the fact pattern that two people, you know, are sitting in a room and they're talking about committing a crime, right? And they're like, hey, you know, do you want to help me kill 
my spouse and the other person is like, yeah, I'd love to help you kill your spouse. And they start kind of hatching a plan on how to do it. And then they shake hands, right? Well, at that moment at common law, that would be common law conspiracy, right? When that express agreement between two or more people to commit a criminal act with the proper intent occurs, right? At that moment in time, we have a conspiracy, a conspiracy to commit murder, right? And that would be an express agreement where the facts tell us we have two people sitting in a room and they're actually agreeing to commit some sort of crime, right? Imagine shaking hands with someone. It's like, hey, you know, do you want to help me kill so-and-so? And the person's like, yeah, I do. Let's shake on it, right? That's an express agreement to, you know, commit a crime. That's common law conspiracy, very obviously. Now, in real life, oftentimes, prosecutors are not going to have these types of facts available to them, right? It's rare that criminals are going to memorialize their criminal agreements in a signed writing, right? Like a contract, right? Most of the time, this stuff is happening orally and the prosecutors aren't going to have access to that evidence, right? There's not going to be no record of it. Now, it is possible, right? You could have a writing. Um, the police could tap a phone. You might have a recorded phone conversation where you get the agreement on tape. That would be an express agreement and that would be great for the prosecution. But a lot of the time, the prosecution has to imply that there was an agreement kind of based on the conduct of the parties, right? And what you're usually looking for here in the facts is choreographed movements, right? A crime that looks really rehearsed or choreographed to the point that there's really no chance that there was not an agreement between the parties, right? Imagine a bank robbery. Right? Imagine that a person goes into a bank, they put on like a clown mask, right? Some distinctive mask. They put on a clown mask to conceal their face and they go in and they rob the bank. And as soon as they come out of the bank, around the corner flies a person in a car wearing the same type of clown mask, right? They get out of the car, they pull up, they get out of the car and they help the other person load all the money that was just stolen into the car and they both floored off away, right? They escaped the scene. Well, in that fact pattern, we don't have an express agreement between two or more persons, right? The facts don't tell us at any point that these two people sat down and shook hands and said, let's commit a bank robbery. But based on those facts, we can imply that there had to be an agreement. It's too choreographed. What are the odds that at the exact same time, you know, party A is robbing the bank wearing a clown mask, party B is pulling a getaway car outside the bank at the exact same moment wearing the exact same disguise, helping this guy load the money into the car. It's too choreographed, too rehearsed. There had to be an agreement. There's no way that person just stumbled upon a bank robbery pulled out a clown mask that happened to be the same as the other defendants, you know, starts helping them load money into the car, right? We can infer that there was an agreement between the two parties, even though we don't have an express handshake deal to commit the crime, right? So important to recognize an agreement is basically just a meeting of the minds to commit some sort of crime. Doesn't have to be an express agreement. If we have an express agreement, that's great, but we can find an implied agreement based on the conduct of the parties, especially when the activity looks really choreographed or rehearsed. Next, we need the, an agreement between two or more persons to commit a criminal act or to accomplish a legal act by unlawful means. This is called the object of the agreement, right? And usually this is really straightforward, right? We're looking for an agreement to commit a crime or a series of crimes, right? Any criminal act will do. The interesting thing about this element though at common law is that the object of the agreement need not constitute a crime. Contemplated acts that are corrupt, dishonest, fraudulent, or immoral were sufficient. Of course, today, right, in pretty much every jurisdiction, we need the object of the agreement to actually be criminal, right? It has to be illegal, right? But at common law, it was possible that the object of the agreement need not constitute a crime, right? As long as the contemplated acts were corrupt, dishonest, fraudulent, or immoral, that was sufficient to satisfy the second element, object of the agreement, 
requirement. So at common law, technically, right, say that two people form an agreement to put somebody under a lot of pressure to have them enter into a contract, right? That's really unfavorable for the other side, right? So two people come together and they say, hey, let's put so-and-so, right, under a lot of pressure, you know, exert a lot of undue influence over this person, right? Have them sign this contract that's really favorable for us and terrible for him, right? Technically, that may not be criminal, right? Depending on the facts, you could do that, you know, without breaking a law, right? But it would be dishonest and immoral, right? Putting someone under a lot of pressure, you could open yourself up to civil liability for things like undue influence, duress, right? There could be all kinds of, you know, issues there, right? From a civil liability perspective, there could be a lot of, you know, dishonest or immoral aspects of it, but it's not necessarily a crime, right? Putting somebody under pressure to have them sign a contract is not necessarily criminal, but at common law, that would still be sufficient, right? That's immoral, dishonest enough, right? It exposes them probably to civil liability. At common law, that would be sufficient to satisfy this second element requirement. Today, in most jurisdictions, that would not be sufficient, right? We need an actual crime. The object of the agreement has to be criminal. Okay, but that's our second element, kind of just the object of the agreement requirement. Usually on criminal law, fact crimes is really straightforward, right? We're going to have a conspiracy to commit murder or larceny or burglary, right? It's gonna be very obvious that the object of the agreement is criminal. Right, but just something to be aware of, at common law, it didn't necessarily have to constitute a crime to satisfy the second element. Finally, we get to the mens rea requirement, right? Our first two elements are kind of the actus reus. Our third element is the mens rea requirement. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program, or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap. Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata video. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, 
um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudicata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Studicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive, that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career. And I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.